What up, guys? Welcome to episode seven of the Desplan Therapy Podcast. Today, I'm speaking with Craig Valentine, also known as the most productive man in the world and habit building expert. So, in a second, he's going to tell our, the audience a little bit about what he does and who he is. So, yeah, just uh, tell our audience a little bit about who you are, what you do, and how you got started with the fitness industry and what you're currently doing today. Yeah, absolutely. Great question. So when I was younger, I wanted to be a strength and conditioning coach in the National Hockey League of all things, because I grew up in Canada. And man, that's that's what everybody did in my hometown was I played hockey. And I realized I couldn't get to the NHL unless I was like a coach. So I went to um, a university and I got a master's degree in exercise physiology. And at that time, I stumbled across an opportunity to write for Men's Health magazine. I was very fortunate, got in the magazine at an early age. And then they had me on their their forum answering questions. And, and people started asking me, hey, will you make me a program? And then I just, after a, a making a whole bunch of programs, I realized, you know what, why don't I just make one program and sell it? And then that turned into my first info product. And then I created something called Turbulence Training, which became very famous about 10 years ago or 15 years ago. Sold hundreds of thousands of copies of it, sold the body weight workout videos. And I have videos on YouTube that have been watched 3 million times. Uh, but then I eventually stepped out of that industry and started coaching other fitness experts, online gym owners, boot camp owners to grow their business. And then I started helping small business owners in multiple industries. And that's what I do today. That's really cool. So can you tell the people a little bit more what made Turbulence Training stand out and how you positioned it? I think I was like the only person on the internet selling <laughs> workouts at the time. No, th so that was like kind of it. I was a first mover fast to to be online. But back when I started, like in 2001, nobody, hardly anybody was talking about interval training and uh, resistance training, metabolic training and that sort of stuff. Now, CrossFit, I didn't hear about CrossFit until a couple years after that, but it started around the same time. And it, um, it was kind of talking about the same sort of stuff. And now today, everybody talks about that stuff. But when I started, hardly anyone was. So it stood out. It was short 30, 45 minute workouts you could do at home because I was writing for the men's health reader who only had dumbbells in the basement. And that's a real key, real key message there is make sure you know who you're talking to and what they want and what they're willing to do and what their obstacles are. And once you know that, you can come along with a message that just hits them right in the heart and that will get them to buy uh, without a whole lot of hard work. Yeah, because really people want to, especially coming into the new year in 2019, people want to work out efficiently. They want to spend all of their day in the gym, especially if they're new to the fitness lifestyle. And that sort of brings me to my next question is um, I want to talk a little bit with you about building successful habits to achieve your fitness goals in the new year. Oh, absolutely. So I wrote a book called The Perfect Day Formula. And in the book, there's five pillars of success. And these came from what I learned in the 15 years of running transformation contests in the fitness world. And I realized that if you had these five pillars in place, you could achieve success in fitness, but also in your personal life and in your career and all these things. And so I, can I share all five of them? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so the first one is called better planning and preparation than ever before. So it has to be better planning and preparation than ever before, and not just your regular planning, not just what you tried last year that didn't work. No, you actually have to, to do a lot of planning because detailed planning, like your meal prep, um, you know, setting aside when you're gonna go to the gym, maybe hiring a trainer, you know, that sort of stuff, and putting it on the calendar in advance because you didn't do that last year and it didn't work. And that's why this year your planning has to be better than ever before. So that's pillar number one. The second one is professional accountability. This is like having a coach. And essentially, the analogy that I use is that this is like having a, a coach who helps you train for a marathon. He's going to give you expert advice, or she is going to give you expert advice, and hold you accountable to showing up to those training sessions. And that's key. You must have professional accountability in any area of life, whether it's getting a business coach or a mentor in your business or a speaking coach or a personal trainer, whatever it is that you want to change in your life, you need a coach, someone where you have an actual working relationship with them because of that accountability. Now, the next pillar is positive social support. And here I continue the marathon running analogy. The positive social support are like the people on the side of the road. 
they're cheering you and they're, you know, you're running up the hill and, and you're fatigued and they're saying, you can do it, you can do it. And you need those people, but that's not expert advice. And, and if you fall down, if you struggle, if you miss a training session, those are the types of people who say, ah, don't worry about it. You'll get it tomorrow, which is not what you need. So you need professional accountability. Then you need your positive social support to pick you up when you're feeling down. Then the fourth thing is a meaningful incentive. And when I was starting out, I only thought that any old incentive would do. I didn't think you had to have a meaningful incentive. And then I realized I'd been running these transformation contests and I was paying people good money. Like some people were winning $3,000 to win my transformation contest. And I thought, man, I'm going to pay you $3,000 so that you, to get you to lose weight. And why would anybody drop out? But only one out of five people finished. And what I realized was when I read the hundreds and hundreds of essays that people had to, everybody had to submit an essay. So I read hundreds over the years. And I realized the people that actually had success were people that were doing it for something more than money. They were doing it for their kids. They were doing it to get the relationship back with their spouse. They were doing it for a meaningful incentive. And that was a huge game changer in my mind when I realized, you know what? That's why I drop out of things. That's why I don't stick to things is because I, I say, oh, you know, I see my friends doing something. I should take that, you know, I should take up chess or I should take up yoga or I should take up something that somebody else is doing just because I, I think it's cool, but I don't really care. And so I drop out because it's not meaningful to me. So the fourth pillar is a meaningful incentive. And then finally, the fifth pillar is one of the most important ones of all, perhaps the most important. And it is the big deadline. You must have a big deadline in your transformation that spurs you to get going. Because you say, hey, I'm going to commit to a 60-day program. Man, you're running out of time as soon as you commit. You know, Days are counting down and it gets you going. And it also keeps you going when times get tough because you'll have momentum and motivation for the first two weeks. And then all of a sudden you're like, man, I don't want to you know, do this workout again. I don't want to skip you know, watching television. I don't want to you know, have to not be able to go to happy hour or you know, only have one drink at happy hour. I want to be able to have four drinks and chicken wings. And you know, so you'll have tough times. And if you say, but you know what, I'm, I'm 30 days into this. I only have 30 days left. I'm going to stick to it. That deadline really powers you through. And then as you get closer to the finish line, all of a sudden you're like, man, I'm going to be perfect for these last seven days. Just like you probably, you don't run a little bit faster, but you can push a little bit faster. You, you have that optimism in that last mile of the marathon. When you see the finish line, you're probably running faster at mile 26 than you were at mile 20 because you know, you're almost there. So. The deadline is so important because it gets you going, it keeps you going, and makes you go faster to the end. And when you have all five of those pillars in place, you can change any aspect of your life. Yeah, they're really great uh, framework to change your life. And I think one of the important keys you're mentioning here is um, going a little bit faster towards the end because you're so motivated to hit that deadline. And that, that makes me think about the importance of not trying to do too much at first when you're starting a fitness lifestyle, especially with the New Year's resolutions coming up. And I know you mentioned a lot about having a to-do list for organization, but what would you recommend for someone who doesn't want to like get overwhelmed or have never had a to-do list or never tried balancing their organizing their fitness and their lifestyle? What would be like a good starting place without doing too much to derail their progress? I think you just gave some really great advice, which is don't try and do too much. So I see this in a lot of the entrepreneurs that I work with these days and basically anybody who's busy is we try and put too much on our to-do list, right? And we say, oh, you know, I'm going to wake up and, and man, when people tell me they're going to do two-a-day workouts, I'm like, you're crazy. You can't do that. That's not going to fit in your lifestyle. So definitely don't jump into that, but try and do stuff in blocks and batches. So instead of trying to do 19 things in a day, why don't I just try and do three to five things really well? And that's why meal prep on a Sunday works so well, because you make like meals for, you know, four to five days and it's all done at once. And if you had tried to do a meal every single day, it would have taken you two to three times as much time. And then it's like, OK, instead of trying to work out seven days a week, you know, for 30 minutes, maybe I'll just do two or three workouts of an hour. And and that way it cuts down on on time for me to go to the gym or whatever it is. Or maybe you just say, I'm not going to go to the gym at all. I'm just going to do bodyweight workouts on YouTube. And, you know, you can watch some of my videos that have been, you know, watched millions of times on YouTube. So you have those options. You just need to think, like, what's going to fit my lifestyle and then not overwhelm yourself? 
Yeah, it's really important to, especially with survival of the lifestyle changes. I know you talk about that a lot in your book, The Perfect Day Formula. And I find for me, like, the lifestyle change is the biggest thing because earlier into my fitness career, there'd be stuff where, like, I'd be working out so hard. But you also have to learn how your body works. And, oh, if you're going to do twice a day, how is your energy going to be? Because you're right now working nine to five and you don't know what it's like to ha have that expenditure of energy from working out. So you have to learn that balance of, oh, if I train at this time, how's my energy going to be? So for me, with my to-do list, I kind of anticipate where I want my blocks of energy, depending on like what I've chosen to do for the day. That way I can know kind of how I'm going to feel afterwards because you don't really want to, especially when you start with your, your fitness journey, to do workouts that are going to make you completely exhausted because you're not going to enjoy it. And then you end up not following your through with your goals and skipping your routine. Yeah, and I think another really important part there is if somebody jumps in and does too much, they're going to dislike the fitness idea and they're in a, you know they're not going to stick to it and then in a year from now they're going to go I'm not even going to bother because I didn't like it last year it sucked it hurt all that stuff and so what can we do to make something more enjoyable and one of the things that I always always telling my clients is the reason I want you to do short workouts and you know the short burst workouts is what I call them is allows you to give yourself more days off so you can go for a walk with the family which is physical activity but enjoyable or you can take up that dance class or whatever it is that that is healthy and good for you, but doesn't make you dislike it. And that's the last thing I want is for somebody to get to the point where they they just don't like working out. And it's the same thing. Like I, you've read the Perfect Day Formula, so you know that I do believe that people will get more done if they wake up a little bit earlier in the morning. And so if you if somebody goes from waking up at 730 in the morning and says, okay, I'm going to start, you know, I'm going to join the 5 a.m. club tomorrow. And they do that two days. They're going to be like, man, this is amazing. I'm getting so much done. And then all of a sudden they're going to crash and they're going to be so fatigued and they're going to go getting up early in the morning is stupid. And then we're going to totally lose them from that. And that's the last thing that you want to have happen about uh, somebody's perspective on the power of an, of a, of a morning start. So you had really, really good points there. And I just, you know, I think the, the real key is to understand one last thing here is that as important as working out is, if you are just, you know, if you're somebody who hasn't been working out for a while and you're struggling with weight, you're going to get 80 or 90% of your results from nutrition changes. And, you know, those are not going to be easy in some cases either because there's some habits built up. But it, it means that you don't have to go and kill yourself in the gym in order to lose weight. Because most of the fat loss is going to come from not drinking soda or not having bad snacks and not binge eating and, and all these things that you'll need to change in other areas of your life. But that's really where you're going to get massive, massive changes. So just understand that you don't have to overdo it in the gym. You have this really cool concept I love from your book of having a not to do list. And this is still something I'm trying to implement. It's more kind of something that's like I keep in the back of my head. But for those who, haven't read their book. Can you tell them a little bit about how they can use a not to do list to structure their day in life? Uh huh. Absolutely. And it, and it is actually, you know, most people have heard about the to do list, and that makes sense. We've been hearing about that since we were kids. Now, the thing with a not to do list is a not to do list might actually be more important because a not to do list keeps you out of trouble. And so, you know, let's go back to the nutrition example. Somebody's Somebody does a really great job. You know, they go and they have smoothies in the morning five days a week and they eat a salad for lunch and some salmon. And then, you know, they, they don't do too bad at dinner. And that's five days in a row. And then all of a sudden they go and they hang out with their friends and it's pizza and wings and beer and chocolate and ice cream and all this stuff. And they eat as much in two days as they did in the last five days. And they wonder why they're not getting ahead. And it's because they need to have a not to do rule or not to do list. And it could be built around, Hey, listen, I, I don't cheat more than once on the weekend. I have one cheat meal on the weekend. That's it. Or I don't drink more than two drinks because if I drink more than two drinks, all of a sudden I'm making really bad diet decisions. And so by putting those boundaries in place, like I do not hit the snooze button. That means I get up on time every single day. So I'm not late. I do not, uh, you know, drink during the week. I call it school nights. I don't drink on school nights. So I don't drink Sunday night, Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, Thursday night. I, I'll have a couple of glasses of wine or a cocktail on the weekend, but I'm not going to drink during the week because I don't want to be groggy in the morning because I want, really want to get up and do my writing and all the stuff that I do in my business. So if you start putting these not to do things in place and you don't have to have a lot of them, 
You just have to have enough that stop you from the really bad, bad uh, temptations in your life. Then all of a sudden, all the good stuff that you're working so hard at becomes more effective because I see too many people struggle with too much in too many areas of life where it is all wiped out bit by one or two bad things that wipe out the 10 or 12 good things. So that's how we use a not to do list in multiple areas of our life. It kind of seems like also related to what you spoke about in the book about how defaulting to a bad habit by not understanding what's in your not to do list can actually make the, the, the wire in your brain stronger and harder to break. And I find it's the same for nutrition in terms of being adherent. Every time you choose that good option, every time you do that workout that you don't want to do, it's going to make it so much, so much easier to say yes to going to the gym and saying no to eating the bad food just because the same thing goes for the bad habit. You mentioned like the wiring gets strong and hard to break. Every time you, you don't abide by your to-do list and you have easy access to those triggers for the food or whatever, it's going to make it easier to say yes or no, vice versa. Yeah, absolutely. And, and so one thing I'll add to that is you made a really great point there. You say easy access to triggers. And there, there's a lot of books out there and articles and scientific research that can tell you how to set up your kitchen so that you have fewer of those triggers. And it's very, very simple stuff. Like if you take a, a bowl of cookies and you put them out or, you know, a plate of cookies and you put them out on the counter, you're going to walk by and, and pick them up and eat them. In fact, uh, you know, this is, we're doing this at the holidays and there's chocolate, you know, just sitting on the counter in my house. And every time I walk by, I'm like, oh, there's a chocolate covered blueberry. Obviously it's healthy for me. So I'll just have one. And, you know, over the course of the day, you have like 40 of them. Now, if you set it up so those chocolate covered blueberries are in a, a jar that you can't see into and it's in the cupboard and it's in the top cupboard at the back, you're not going to eat 40 chocolate covered blueberries in a day because that trigger is not there. Likewise, on the positive side, they've shown that if you put fruits and vegetables at eye level in your fridge, you're more likely to eat them. If you put fruits and vegetables on your counter, you're more likely to eat them. If you put fruits and vegetables at the you know, the front and the end of the cashier line in your child's cafeteria, your children are more likely to choose fruits and vegetables. And so you can re-engineer your environment to make you more successful. And it, it goes with business, it goes with health, it goes with anything. If you want to be successful, if you want to achieve a goal, hang around people, put yourself in an environment where that goal is made easier. And if you, you know, like for an extreme example is if you're a recovering alcoholic, you know, you're, you can't go to a bar. That's the worst place you should go. You should go to places where there's no alcohol because it'll keep you out of trouble. So environment is key. That's a huge one. I totally forgot to mention that. And it's really cool um, how you can reverse engineer. I never really considered the cost, but kind of almost kind of happens once you get into the flow of your meal prep and your training, your business stuff. Just kind of like how you set up your workstation. It kind of like you find what works best for you and then as you mentioned in your book, you try to optimize it even when you're traveling. You know where you, how you work. You set yourself up at the airport and you pretend you're in your re-engineered environment. Yeah, absolutely. And even, even when I land, you know, the first place that I go when I land in any city is a grocery store. So I don't go straight to the hotel or the wherever I'm staying. But it's like, man, I got to, you know, I look it up online and I, you know, I Uber to a grocery store and then I Uber from the grocery store to the hotel and I set up. And it's like, this is as close to home as possible. Now, obviously, there's going to be some transition. Especially, obviously, if you're on vacation, it's going to be quite different. But at least start the day with a healthy breakfast. You know, Don't deviate too much. Just because you're on holiday doesn't mean you have to go crazy, crazy. And just because you're in an airport, and it's so funny, I always tell this story. It's like, I see grown men, as soon as they go in the airport, it's like they just become children again because there's like fast food joints. And they think that, oh, when you're in the airport, you know, my business traveler friends, when you're in the airport, you can eat whatever you want. No, you can't eat whatever you want just because you're in an airport and there's all this junk sitting around. And, and nowadays, there's no excuses because there's so much healthy food in, in many major airports that there's no excuse uh, you know, to be like a kid in the candy store. So yeah, it's, it's, it's really just, it goes back to that first pillar, which is better planning and preparation than ever before. And if you're willing to do the planning and preparation of thinking about this, of thinking about where you should be eating in advance, it makes everything so much easier. What's your best advice for if you have trouble like ignoring your triggers for bad habits? I know, for example, you mentioned something in your book, how when you want to look at your phone or a certain time you go into Microsoft Word doc and start doing your writing. But how do you like 
avoid ignoring them because it's so easy to just not open the dock and stay on your phone or even to choose that, yeah. that bad meal or the fast food versus knowing it's your trigger. Yeah. So great questions. And, and one is scheduling. So, you know, you need to have that stuff scheduled that, you know, during your work day, it's like, okay, I've, I've got something that has to be done by a certain time, or I've got a meeting starting at a certain time, which stops you from being on your phone. I mean, you, you know, you and I certainly couldn't be doing this if we were too busy on our phones. So that's one thing. And then second of all is, you know, just keep remove the temptation. So I put the phone in another room, I put it in airplane mode, and I actually turn it off and put it in a drawer when I need to focus on work, like writing my next book. Because otherwise, that thing's there, it's dinging, you might, you might like hear a phantom noise, think, oh, I think it buzzed, and even though it didn't buzz, you don't even have it set up to buzz, but you think it buzzed. And that's, you know, it's just removing of the temptations. And I like to use the analogy that you need to build a fence around yourself. Because here's the thing with the phone is that every single day, there's like 150 engineers with PhDs from like MIT working at Instagram to make you addicted to your phone. Now, I don't care how smart you are, 150 PhDs against you every single morning, you're losing that battle. These guys are winning. They've made Instagram absolutely addictive. They've made Facebook addictive. They've made them all addictive. They've won this game and you have to circumvent this one way or another. And it's the same with food. We've had our top food scientists in the world for the last 30 to 40 years making Doritos addictive, making chocolate more addictive, making all these candies more addictive. You know, like the, the candy that I have on my counter right now that I was telling you before, it's it's blue and, and yellow. You know, it's, it's chocolate covered um, apricots. And then I had chocolate covered cherries, but I ate all of those already. And then I have chocolate covered blueberries and they're blue. So they're eye catching. And they probably have tested this somewhere that you will eat more of them if they're a, a different color. So you're working against these people and you have to fight them off with their own medicine by removing the things as much as possible. That's actually really huge advice right there. So it comes down to, again, organization and having that discipline and being proactive and not reactive. You mentioned that a lot in your book, being proactive and how lacking discipline in your areas of your life can really handicap not just your fitness, but your personal life, your relationships, everything. Yeah. And, and so what I want to say there is that the proactive approach actually helps you lose, uh, use less discipline because discipline is a finite resource. And, and the funny thing about discipline is we have the most discipline early in the day when we don't need it. I mean, there's not too many people that are struggling with eating chocolate cake first thing in the morning. Now, I know there's donuts and stuff, but most of us can go, you know what? Between a donut and a healthy breakfast, you know, everything else being equal, I can choose the healthy breakfast. I've got discipline here. But as the day goes on and you deal with people and struggles and frustration, your willpower decreases. So when you go home at night or when you go out with friends, all of a sudden when the chocolate cake and the pizza and the alcohol comes around, it's so hard for you to overcome that. And that is just the funny way that we are wired in our lives. It's We have discipline in the morning when we don't need it, and we have no discipline at night when we absolutely need it. So just make sure that you are proactive and that you plan ahead to avoid the temptations and then you need less, less discipline. So proactive equals requiring less discipline. Reactive means you go to a party and you have no plan. You maybe didn't eat healthy all day and you're like starving. And the next thing you know, you eat an entire pizza by yourself because you were reactive and you, you didn't have any discipline and you just, that was the worst case scenario. So how is having a to-do list related to your concept of setting process goals? How do those work hand in hand to make progress and maintain your momentum? Yeah, great question. So, so the way that I help people set goals for like 60 days, 90 days, et cetera, is to use something called a, a outcome goal first. So an outcome goal would be like, I want to lose 20 pounds in 90 days. It's a numbers-based outcome goal. Great. Now, here's the thing is we don't fully control an outcome goal. There's going to be so many external factors that are going to influence whether I lose 20 pounds or 22 or 15 or whatever. You know, it could be that I have to go on a work trip and there's absolutely no gym and I'm, and I'm forced to eat greasy food. There's nothing I can do about that. Now, on the other hand, we can control our process goals and our process goals are the action steps that we take to move towards our outcome goal. So if Mrs. Jones came to me and said, Craig, I want to lose 20 pounds in 90 days, 
I would say, great, Mrs. Jones, here's what you're going to do. You're going to use turbulence training three times per week. And as long as you're home and you're in control of your time, you have full control of that process goal. The second process goal is you're going to get nutrition coaching from you know this program and you're going to follow it 90% of the time. And that's fully within your control. And then finally, the last thing you're going to do is you're going to drink three liters of water per day or you know green tea or whatever it is. And so, all right, Mrs. Jones, if you do those three things, you'll get as close as possible to your outcome goal. Great. Now we have our process goals in place and we can start taking a look at our to-do list. And our to-do list would be, okay, today we need to, well, on Sunday, we need to do our meal prep and plan our meals up for the week. We need to make sure we have bottles of water or whatever it is in the house. And then on Monday, we're, our to-do list is going to include a workout and maybe some more grocery shopping. And our to-do list the next day would make sure that we had our water prepared and all this stuff. And then Wednesday, back to the gym. And, and we just all start aligning our to-do list with our process goals, which align with our outcome goal. And the next thing you know, we have exceeded what we plan to achieve. That's super cool. It kind of helps you not do too much at once, but also kind of kind of like under promising and over delivering kind of same idea. You're you're being more prepared and you're getting the best bang for your buck by taking these steps slowly and kind of in a systematic way. Yeah, absolutely. And and what we're doing is we're just we're taking something that seems super complex, right? Like, oh my gosh, I need to lose 20 pounds. I don't know where to start. And we break it down. And then once we've broken it down into the three process goals, we can go, you know what, we can break this down even further. And we can break this down into a daily to do list, we can break this down into, you know, 72 hour to do seven day to do I actually do this with my clients as we build out this in really big 90 day plan of what they need to do at certain intervals in order to achieve their goals. And when they're done, they sit back and they go, Oh, this is just so simple. Now that we've broken it down and put in it and written it out, like I didn't realize how simple it was going to be. It's not going to be easy. Easy is different than simple, but simple is clear, straightforward. We're focused and we know what to do. Yeah, that's, it's, it's really interesting. Oftentimes you think it's going to be hard, but when you have it written down on paper, just kind of like when you write your goals down on paper, you're that much more committed just by writing it down on paper. 100%, 100%. Keeping those goals in front of you because you can write them down on paper. And then if you put them in a drawer and never look at them, my goodness, I mean, it'll be better than not writing them down at all. But you really do want to re-examine them on a regular basis. You speak a lot about uh, waking up 15 minutes early. Um, is there significance to 15 minutes exactly? And would you want to say, example, say I woke up at 8 and I wake up at 7.45 instead. Would I want to go through my regular routine, for example, shower, eat, then work? Or would you suggest like waking up, getting a little bit alert, and then doing just 15 minutes, 20 minutes of work? And then going on with kind of getting ready for the day, or does it depend on the person? Like, what is the? Because if you just wake up and you spend half an hour, an hour getting ready, getting dressed, brushing your hair, you're not really being productive. No, oh, no. So it's a great question, and and this comes from my personal experience. So what happened was when I was 25, um, you know, and and writing for Men's Health Magazine and doing a little bit of online stuff, I still wanted to be an online, uh, I still wanted to run my, my fitness business online and not be a personal trainer, but I had to be a personal trainer for a while because I didn't have any other way to make regular money. So what I did was I would get up at 4.30 in the morning and I would work for my on my online business for 15 to 20 minutes. And then I would go and I would train people all day long from like 6, 6 a.m. till 11 a.m. with a two hour break and then back again till seven o'clock at night. And then I'd go home and I was too tired to work my online business. But 15 minutes a day, six days a week is 72 hours in a year. And in just over a year, I was able to build my online business up to the point where I was able to stop being a personal trainer. And so that's where I got this concept of, hey, listen, if you just get up 15 minutes earlier than you do now, and you go down to your kitchen table and you work on your number one priority in life, and this can be anything. I mean, this can be writing a book. This can be preparing a sales script. This can be you know putting together nutrition coaching plans. This can be reading the Bible if you want to make more time for religious stuff. This can be working on your debt. Like if you're in $3,000 worth of credit card debt and you go down to your kitchen table every morning and you sit there and you plan out like how to cut your expenses and how to increase your income, you're going to be way better off than if you didn't do that 15 minutes per day. So that's where I came up with the idea. It works. It, it sounds so simple, but again, simple works. Simple is successful. 
and I just want everybody to give it a shot. Um, and so what you would do is don't get up 15 minutes earlier every single day. So the next thing you know, you're getting up four hours earlier. No, what I mean is just commit to getting up 15 minutes earlier than you do now. And then the best thing is that you'll probably be up and no one else will be up. And that will allow you to then go and work on something that will move you ahead in life. And that's the key. And this thing can change day to day. It could be starting your your workout 15 minutes earlier, going to the gym 15 minutes earlier, meal prepping before going to work 15 minutes earlier, or it could be writing that blog, working on that social media stuff. You can even theme your days. This is one thing I do. For example, um, tomorrow's the day I spend all day filming. The weekends are for clients. And for me, that's how I kind of do things. So someone who's starting out, they could set three days in the morning, do your meal prep. And then other days they could go to work early, for example. So you don't have to be super strict. Try to find something that I guess you would say fit your lifestyle. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's totally amazing. So uh, what are some things you do personally for for when you work long hours? Uh, well, ta- how do you take care of your posture and your mobility? Do you have like a, a sort of routine or a trigger that you could give our the Deskbound Therapy followers some advice on like things they can do to trigger them to say take a break, for example? Yeah, it's a great question. And so I really cycle through standing up, sitting down. I also, um, you know, I'm fortunate that I, as a self-employed person, what I'll do is I'll work for two hours and then I'll go for a 10 or 15 minute walk. Um, what I like to do is, is go and I, I write a thank you card every day. So I go out to the mailbox, put a thank you card in the mail, come back, get back to work, you know, change my position a couple of times. Then about late morning, I'll go and do my workout. So again, I'm splitting things up. And then in the afternoon, I do some podcasts and sometimes I'm able just to walk around while I do my podcasts so that I'm able to not be in that same position all the time. And and that's really the key is for me, it's just making sure you do that. And then in your training session, uh, you know, just adjust or, or sorry, address, you know, weak, weak spots. So I spend a lot of time in upper back mobility just so that I don't get myself into trouble there. And there you have it. It's, it's that simple. You just have to <laughs> just take more walks and know what you need to do. I think that's a big point. You know that you need to work on your upper back. And I'm always advocating this on YouTube, Instagram, everywhere. When you're starting your mobility, you need to know what you're working on because you only have so much time and you still need to do your workout. So understand what you need. So Craig knows that his upper back is the issue. And that's super important because that narrows down to a certain number of exercises. He doesn't need to spend his time trying to figure out what to do. So the same thing for you if you have like low back pain, folks, and stuff like your hips. So just keeping it simple. Was there ever a point in your life where you had to make a huge lifestyle switch that changed up your fitness routine and kind of threw you off your regular? Yeah, totally. So so back in 2006, I had anxiety attacks. And when you have an anxiety attack, it's very difficult for for you to focus and concentrate and and what when you're having an anxiety attack, it's like your heart is racing and you can't breathe properly. And so you already feel like stressed out and you think, oh, my goodness, if I work out hard, then then it might make things worse. And who knows what will happen to me? So that stopped me from working out properly for several weeks back in 2006 until I finally got myself together. And when I was finally able to get myself together and get back to normal, then getting back in my regular fitness routine helped me avoid being stressed out and avoid having those anxiety attacks again. So it was something that that was short, short lived. I mean, it was only a, a few weeks, but it did totally throw me off track and took me a long time to, well, not a long time, but it took me several weeks to work through it, which was a long time for a guy who was so used to working out all the time. And then unfortunately, I was able to figure out that my breathing needed to be improved. My, you know, my posture was bad. So my breathing was bad. And that, you know, partially contributed to my anxiety in addition to some not so great lifestyle choices like drinking too much and not sleeping enough. And then I, you know, I was like, okay, I'm working too much. I'm drinking too much, not breathing properly. And I went and fixed all of those things. It took me a, a long, t- you know, it took me the six weeks, which was a long time because it felt like I was having a heart attack every day. But when I was finally able to overcome that, I had in place new habits, new systems to never have those issues again. So what are some of these steps or that you took to overcome like getting back to your routine and kind of finding your normal again? Well, one of the biggest things was learning how to breathe properly. And most of us, we breathe from our upper chest and we breathe in these short, shallow breaths. And that increases adrenaline in the body and adrenaline leads to anxiety. So what I had to learn how to do was, you know, I tried yoga, meditation, Qigong, all of these things. And, you know, a lot of those are obviously beneficial for your posture and 
and movement, but I didn't love them. The only one that I was able to stick with was meditation. But fortunately, that was you know one of the main things that I needed to slow down my, my, my sympathetic nervous system and activate my parasympathetic nervous system, which calmed me down. And then in addition to that, I also needed to you know, put in place better habits for work and not work so much. I stopped drinking. I stopped too much caffeine intake and I just stopped a lot of bad habits. And, you know, I was, I had kind of been running on like red line for a long, long time as a young man thinking I could do everything. And it was simply simplifying my life that also contributed in addition to the healthy habits that I had in place. So I was finally able to get rid of that. But I also went to the doctor. And so if anybody is suffering from anxiety, make sure you go to the doctor, make sure they check you out and say, hey, there's nothing physically wrong with you. Once I found that out, that was huge. It was a game changer for me, allowed me to to go, okay, there's nothing physically wrong with me. So it must just be my habits and my systems and my breathing and and I can change this. And that really gave me the power in my mind to go and make the changes that lasted for a long time. I love how you're talking about like the importance of breathing. It's usually one of the first things, whether I get a new client online or in person, I'm always going to teach them how to breathe with their diaphragm because it's so, so important because a lot of the times you're going to be learning and teaching new form and that's the most easy to forget. You'll just see people holding the breath and focusing more on the cues, but really you want to do your breathing. Make sure you learn how to breathe through your diaphragm and your core because that's actually going to make your workouts more efficient because but when you do breathe, you're engaging a lot of those muscles in your core. And then on top of that, after a workout year, again, you have that adrenaline, you have that high, but you also want to be able to bring yourself back down. So doing some breathing at the end is a good way you kind of get back. So you work out at lunch. It's a good way you can kind of relax down, get back to a normal breathing rate, relax the nervous system. So just lying on the on your back after a workout, after you're stretching five minutes, can make a huge difference through the rest of the day. Oh, man, that's great advice. One more question for you here. You mentioned earlier when you go for a walk um, to give a thank you letter. Is that part of your daily gratitude routine? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, when I was younger, I was very envious of other people and I was embarrassed by it and ashamed by it. And I decided, you know what, instead of being envious, I'm going to write a thank you card to anybody that I feel envious of. And when I started doing that, you know, like you said, it's part of my gratitude ritual. It puts me in a better mood. Um, always bright, you know, it puts a smile on my face when I put, put in the mailbox because they don't know that it's going to come. They don't know it's going to show up at their house and, you know, it's going to put a smile on their face too. So that has really been a game changer for me. And I started doing that over five years ago and I try and do one every single day. Sometimes I'll do more. If I'm gone for a long time, I'll do less, but it really just is fun. And I love it when someone totally doesn't expect it and they get this thank you card from me. And then, you know, they send me a really nice email and it just strengthens our relationship. But it's also has many other benefits as well. That's so awesome. A lot of times you don't get cards anymore and it just means so much more than an email. Even if you're sending someone or uh, totally. sending a client a gift or something, it just it has a it shows a lot of action. So is there any last advice you could give the followers about achieving their goals in 2019? Oh, man. Yeah. So I think the most important thing that I can tell you is to have some sort of accountability. So accountability, either through a coach or through a friend that is going through the same thing with you. Like when you're in, a, in an environment where everybody's moving towards a similar goal and everyone's positive, that, that just allows you to move mountains in your life. So make sure that you're in the right environment, whether it's online or, or offline. So you know if, if you're in an area where it's like, man, I, I go to the gym here, but nobody's positive, you can still go online and find positive forums or get an online coach. And that positivity is enough to keep you going. So make sure that you have positive people in your life. That's some great advice. Thanks so much for joining us today. It's been an amazing conversation. We're going to definitely have you back again. So just letting people know where they can get your book, where they can follow you on social media so they can stay connected with you. Absolutely. So you can go and get my book at freeperfectdaybook.com or you can find me on Instagram at Real Craig Balance. Awesome. Thanks so much, Craig. Appreciate your time. No problem.